Welcome to season four, episode three of the Open Educator, the best place to be on a Tuesday morning. Thank you for joining us and for taking that first step to grow personally and professionally. I encourage everyone with a camera to turn it on and listen with intention. The Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program at USF is unique compared to all other programs. First, we develop students to create businesses, to be the traditional entrepreneur. And if you walk down downtown Tampa, downtown St. Pete, downtown Sarasota, you will see a range of businesses started by our alumni. Our second pillar, we help individuals become entrepreneurs or innovators within firms, helping to create new products and services to manage them and to grow market share for those companies. I have more than 15 to 20 students working at firms such as Amazon, Apple, Instagram, Meta, Google, you name it. And the third main pillar of the program is to develop students to define careers they define themselves, not what others define for them. And we have many students doing just that, recreating what is possible, recreating careers and jobs that currently or didn't exist, new businesses, new business models, and paving the way that they desire. Our next guest is a great example of this. Having known her for a few years and followed her career, we are honored to have her on this cast today. In my view, she epitomizes much of the entrepreneurial mindset that we talk about, much of the entrepreneurial activity within a firm we talk about, and using these same entrepreneurial skills, which I would argue are life skills, to help craft her career journey. In 2020, she was Folio's top woman in media honoree and has spent the last 15 years with a company you may know of, ESPN. Today, she serves as vice president, audience, of ga audience engagement, a division of ESPN's content organization. She leads several teams through the curation of content across all of these digital experiences. This includes ESPN.com, ESPN app and mobile, the OTT devices, and ESPN fantasy app. Our next guest will be sharing her journeys and experiences. Please give a warm welcome to Nicole Palaez Dandre. Nicole, please welcome and thanks for joining us this Tuesday morning. Where does this cast find you and can you bring us up to speed? Yes, absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you very much. I'm super excited to be here. For some reason, I like to talk about this stuff. <laughs> I do it all the time at work. Um, so love to help sort of share information and um, answer questions. So hopefully I'll get to, to field a few today. You know, I think quickly, I'll just say two months ago, I just celebrated my 15th year at ESPN. Um, super hard to believe that this Tampa native actually made it this long up in the Northeast. Um, let alone that the fact that ESPN was a lot like willing to have me this long, you know, at some point I thought the, the rug was going to get pulled out from underneath me and they're going to be like, yeah, okay, no, but that hasn't happened. And I'm going to tell you, it's super cold up here. So I sorely miss soft beaches and the West coast sunset. So hoping I'm going to get back down to the area here really soon. Um, a little bit of a personal note. I'm a proud mom of two boys. They play multiple sports. Um, I like to call myself a mobile tailgate. I literally have all the goods, tents, everything, you name it, I got it. Um, that usually fills up my social media feeds along with showing off a lot of old school Bucks memorabilia that I've been collecting for years. So, and nothing's a reprint. I got all original stuff. Little, that's just a little bit about me. I mean, I've been a sports fan forever. Um, actually wasn't sure I would work in sports, but that that seemed to happen. And I'm sure we'll get into some of that, you know, along the way. But today, you know, as, as Stephen sort of articulated, I'm mostly focused on digital experiences and very specifically ESPN's owned digital experiences. So that's not what ESPN is doing on Instagram or, or Snapchat um, or other platforms like that, even YouTube, although my team does support YouTube. Um, it's really the ESPN owned digital experiences. So it's an editorial team um, that, that I lead. And, you know, we're literally positioning all of the content that you see, right? You rambled all of them off, whether it's .com, the mobile app, all your OTT devices. 
Um, and I think the one thing that's notable here that's super interesting, and it's it's been a big thing for me these last couple of years, was ESPN Plus, which was our first direct-to-consumer product. I mean, as I think most folks know, right, you have a lot of streaming um, products out there today, but ESPN traditionally has been sort of that over-the-top service that you pay the Comcast, the Bright House, Verizons, whomever that may be, um, and that's how you get for lack of a better word, authenticated uh, to receive that content no matter where it goes. So ESPN Plus and actually creating a product going direct to the consumer was a, a pretty significant step forward for us. And when it comes to our digital products, I'm actually commingling that. So we are part direct to consumer. You can only get this if you are you have a direct relationship with ESPN or it's also mingled with content that you actually get access to because you have a relationship with, again, with those Comcast Verizons. It's very, very sort of complicated to kind of pull that in and try to help make sense um, to the fan of what they're getting and, and why. We still have a lot to work to do on that, To be, if I'm being honest. Um, these experiences also, you know, they really are a collection of a lot of different content types. OK, it's a lot. You can read a story. You can read a long story. You can read a short story. You can see a video. You can you get an image with a caption. You can get into a live stream. Oh, you can purchase this. It's I mean, it really is a lot. So if I were to eliminate all of that jargon, the way I really talk about it is we're the handshake to the fan. Um, we really are a 24 seven operation. I assure you, somebody is on our digital products every minute of the day. Um, that does not mean that I work all the time, does not even mean that my people work all the time. And that's even more important, mm -hmm. right? There's a nice balance. You set up the operation in a way that, you know, we're able to accomplish this. I will say this though, it never fails. I feel like every holiday, there's some athlete that goes out late at night, does something he or she probably shouldn't do. And that creates news. So holidays don't really exist for us. <laughs> they could be company time off, but sports events are also, you know, become holidays or happen around holidays. So it's definitely, um, there's an aspect of that that's very different than maybe, you know, being in sports media as opposed to just maybe some traditional um, corporations out there, whether it's, you know, finance, insurance, you, you name it medical field, I think, can appreciate <laughs> what it's like to sort of have to rethink about what your schedule is or set up an environment, right, to sort of be sustainable around the clock. Um, you know, oddly enough, and, and I suspect we'll get into this, it's very strange, but it, I had an epiphany a couple of years ago that my career actually came full circle. I didn't really know I wanted to work in sports until I took a job um, working at the Gainesville Sun while I was in college, eventually left that. And when I moved into digital after some other things that happened before that, the big job they gave me was laying out the website. And it was just really weird. And I hadn't even occurred that that would ever happen, to be honest. Um, I, I sort of never knew what I wanted to be. <laughs> Honestly, it's it's been a very interesting a ride, you know, interesting ride, but I'll just say this. I think when interesting opportunities came up, even if I wasn't sure if it was the right fit, I did it anyways. And oddly enough, some of the work and projects um, I did long before I started at ESPN, which is sort of where I would say my career started. Um, I'm amazed at how many of those things actually came into play or that I've utilized today when I wouldn't have thought they would have intersected at all as from a skill standpoint. Mm -hmm. Let's unpack a little bit about that. You know, many of my students and audience will be graduating soon. And everyone would love to jump into a wonderful career that's well established. But as you stated, you didn't know what you want. And many of my students or audience don't really know. And I liked how you shared that you may be taking a job and not be able to connect the dots forward, but only backwards. So what advice would you have for someone who, okay, they want to work for ESPN in the future, but maybe they can't get a job right now at ESPN. What advice would you have for them in terms of to be a sponge, to try and connect the dots as best forward opposed to just hoping to work at ESPN 
or, or any type of company? And what early advice if in their career would, would you suggest? Because I think you have some wonderful stories um, that highlight this type of, of mindset and, and behavior. So I'm going to, I'm going to say a phrase right now. And I absolutely believe this. Um, I, I believe curiosity is table stakes for career opportunities and or career mobility, depending on where you sort of are. Curiosity, it's table stakes. I, I absolutely believe I benefited from just being somebody who was willing to engage with someone else and willing to ask questions and willing to learn more. Um, you know, gosh, it's, it's skills are transferable. I mean, I think that's another really, really, really important thing. You know, I sort of got things started in college. I got hired sitting at a Bennigan's watching Monday night football to work at a sports section of Gainesville Sun. That doesn't happen like really often, but I was having a conversation with somebody that somebody happened to be the sports editor of the Gainesville Sun at that given point in time. Right. Next thing you know, I enjoyed sports. I knew enough. And they're like, you should come do this. I was a student. And I was like, okay, sounds cool. I'll do it. I like sports. Did I like working nights and weekends? Nah, but I actually enjoyed what I was doing when I was there. Um, and I was learning and I'm like, all right, that's, that's cool. And I spent five and a half years there and I never thought I would have done that. Um, you know, like many do, I think in college, I, I was a bartender. I was a key manager employee. I used to open up a restaurant and, you know, that's also different sets of skills, communication, right? Um, I don't want to just say customer service, but I, if I'm out to dinner today, I treat folks like I wanted to be treated when I was serving them. And, you know, uh, you know, interesting little twist when I was a key employee at a restaurant in Gainesville, somebody walked in to sell me advertising, right? They wanted to talk to somebody about advertising. And this individual was sort of over explaining what in, in measurement forms for newspapers, what a column inch was. And I'm like, hey, man, you don't, you don't need to go there. <laughs> like, I know what a column inch is, right? Because I was just working at a newspaper. And that just sort of got our conversation put in a different place where we could get to business actually a little bit faster because they didn't have to explain everything. And honestly, coming off of that interaction, I got offered to be a general manager of a twice weekly paper in Gainesville. Weird, right? Like I didn't think I would do that. Um, you know, I was even told, I was told not to get a journalism degree thinking I had to go down this path. They're like, keep your business degree. I was like, cool, I'll do that. Right. I like business. I like making money. I like being efficient. I like figuring out how we're going to get things out in the marketplace, but it's just, I don't know. It's, it's weird. It's, I sort of am willing to put myself out there and again, engage in a conversation with just about anyone it's, and you just sort of never know when the opportunity is going to present itself or they're going to enjoy that interaction in such a way that next thing you know, something else is, is coming from it. It's just, it's strange. You don't know what's going to happen in the moment, Stephen. To go back to your question, you may not realize it. I'm, I just want to tell people it will. And if you're really thinking about what I'm doing and not seeing things as mundane work and see sort of the bigger picture of how your work ties into something, you will learn something. You will figure out a way to sort of pay making those types of connections off down the road. You talk about a couple of concepts that we discuss in our creativity and innovation class, or even within entrepreneurship and in, in general, uh, this notion of one curiosity notion of maybe even serendipity. These are common characteristics when we talk about creativity, when we talk about innovation, when we talk about entrepreneurship and these examples you, you, you reference relate to getting a job, relate to exploiting an opportunity or making the most of whatever's in front of you. This also relates to those who want to raise funding in from VCs or from angel investors. So what I'm hearing though is if you put yourself out there, you put yourself in as many situations as you can, you're going to increase your chances for serendipity, for your curiosity yeah. to make yourself stand out and, and, and to maybe, I don't know about playing numbers game, but to potentially create an opportunity. Uh, absolutely. I mean, 
it, and, and it may not be in everyone's wheelhouse, right? I get it. Not everybody, it's very easy to sort of walk up and start striking up a conversation, but you got to start somewhere. I, I really do believe in it. And I think that corporate world, small business, I come from, a, my dad was a small business owner, still is in Tampa, two, two employees. That's it. That's how small. And if there was anything I learned from growing up in that, in that way, it was that relationships. This man had incredible relationships, whether it was about materials he needed, whether it was customers, whether it was he was trying to bid on a job against other bigger companies. He really, really worked relationships quite well. And it's no different in the corporate environment. So it sort of doesn't matter, I think, where you where you go. You've got to figure out how to develop them and how to nurture them. Right. And sometimes how to nurture a relationship is less about what have you done for me lately or what can you give me? It's also what you can give them too, right? Make it, make it two ways wherever you, wherever you can. But there, I do believe there's a numbers game here. Cause if you're just sitting back waiting for something to come to you, I mean, it might, it might, but you know, you create your own look, luck, right. And sometimes, you know, just, Create the good kind, right? Not the bad kind. <laughs> I, I, I'm grateful that you shared that. We, a lot of my students or many people locally, right? They, they have family businesses or I know someone who is an entrepreneur locally. And I love that you shared that there are excellent skills and things to learn from um, that, that can help us in the corporate world. Family business, even how big or small it is, is not separate from big organization. And there's things that you can learn and take away. So I'm happy that you shared that. You mentioned, I know you have a lot of different experiences and I want to kind of tease out the role of innovation at ESPN. Is there a big project that comes to mind that you had an opportunity to work on that kind of epitomizes the notion of developing a product at ESPN or level of service that comes to mind over your 15 years? Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch. I'm going to go with recency, probably over impact here for a minute, because I believe in timing is is a lot of things. And I think the release just came out today that ESPN launched their first fully WNBA fantasy, full on fantasy league game. Now, this is pretty significant, honestly, um, because a game like this has never existed for a women's sport or league period, full stop. Not that there hasn't been coverage. Um, a couple months prior to this, actually, no, at the beginning of women's basketball season, we also launched a whole new suite of pages and um, a whole new experience for women's basketball, honestly. So this has been a few different groups providing support in a whole host of ways to honestly elevate um, this particular coverage. And, and it's timely right now. Um, you know, I think when you see, whether it's the US women's national team fighting for equal pay, right? There's just a lot going on in the world today as it, as it relates to um, diversity and inclusion, um, equity, and wherever we can be a part of innovating and creating better experiences that um, come from that place, that's always that's always going to be important to me personally. Let me unpack that. Fascinating. Yeah. I'm hap we're happy to be part of that journey that launched today because I agree, it's important. One thing that we always talk about are the challenges to lift an idea off the ground, off the ground to get support for an idea that may be counterintuitive due to an outdated mindset or however you want to use jargon on return on investment or costs, mm -hmm. et cetera. This is important. So I'm sure there was pushback or people would say this won't work. People don't want this. How does that happen and change the discussion at ESPN to go from some th this type of product for fantasy for women's basketball to not exist to to exist and to make sure that it succeeds what happens in terms of to get over those barriers or how does that does that work and, and develop that type of product or service develop at, at espn yeah i mean i think it's it's a few things with this particular one 
I feel like we had enough energy from a, cause this takes a lot of different teams to pull this off. There's a lot of folks who have some sort of a contribution in order to um, enhance coverage, if you will. I mean, it's like five different teams are now taking on additional work or leaving other work behind to replace it with this type of work. You know, for, for this particular instance, and I think we had seen it, you know, viewership and popularity of women's hoops in particular has really, really um, skyrocketed a lot. And it's not to say that because we didn't have this, we still weren't best in media when it came to women's sports coverage, because we were. But I like to come at things from a position of strength, quite frankly. And we had enough people sort of sniffing around smaller ideas to where we got kind of lucky that enough folks got into a room and just said, but if we did this and this and this, so it takes collaboration, of course. And sometimes not everybody wants to maybe take the initiative as far as, you know, the dream is, but this is where learning the art of influence, I think becomes super important. Like I like to coach and lead folks through the lens of its influence over authority it's super, super, super easy to, to lead a team of however many and tell them this is what we're gonna do. But in instances like this, this was literally like multiple teams coming together to influence how to take smaller wins and make it something that's much, much bigger. Um, you know, there's other spaces where I think it becomes more challenging. Um, a different space that I think is challenging and I'll just, I'll say it this way. And I just came from the MIT Sports Analytics Conference in Boston these past couple of days. Um, and so you hear a lot about innovation there. Talk about VR and like just how data is going to change how we do everything. You, you hear it. You hear it all there. Um, but I think sports analytics is an interesting space. Like me personally, I can totally like geek out on all sorts of cool metrics and what they mean. And, and, and all of that, like I can, but that's not always easily digestible when you're talent or you're trying to do some form of new storytelling, right? To, to say why this one particular thing that happened in, in a game was monumental because now you need historical. It's just, it's sort of different in sports analytics itself. And I think there's a lot of innovation driving. How can we take this deeper, richer data and be out in front of storytelling. And what does that look like? What's the experience if you're a viewer on TV? What's the experience if you are playing around with things in digital? I think that is um, a particular space where I think we've got some work to do that we've got to continue to figure out where specifically sports analytics can be. Um, where do we make the most of it? The women's example, again, just timely it was something we needed to do. And I think everybody sort of realized that. And that's why there was other smaller efforts sort of bubbling up already. What about this? What about that? But there's other places too, where it's like, we're not doing enough. And that's why there's sports analytics conferences for us to go get inspired a little bit at, at what that future could be. To, to unpack that a little, just to relate it to the content that we cover. As Nicole mentioned, there was some momentum or there was a lot of other people bubbling ideas around supporting women's basketball, if it was fantasy or other related and overlapping. Many of these turned into small wins, maybe smaller projects, and then built a, a broader uh, support system to envision maybe this fantasy app or the this broader service that can be brought to the market. So we start seeing the same concepts of scaling and enrolling Definitely. people in the vision and it wasn't this big tsunami, we're gonna roll this out in one day. There was many small wins over a long period of time to enroll probably different levels of management, different disciplines, different departments, different possibilities and iterations of those same projects to culminate to the launch of what you mentioned today, the fantasy app for women's basketball. So these are exactly the same skills we talk about in scalability, exactly the same approach of why Persuasion is so important. Prototyping, milestones, small wins, addressing one small niche to see if it can be replicated and then grown 
before more resources are needed. So these are, this is a fabulous example. Thank you for, for sharing that. I want to push and maybe a little off script. You just came from MIT Sports Analytics. I recently came back from the largest Web3 conference in the world at East Denver. There's a transition happening, uh, like many things, but transitioning with, with the internet and with data. I would argue, and there's a lot of momentum to suggest Web3 will reshape how we engage with others through the internet, how we re re-engage or shape how our data is being used. And in fact, we will control all our data and, and we'll place our ability to engage, complement, build a reputation, and reap the benefits of our engagement and desires through this. Is there any discussion on how this potentially will transform your work at ESPN if Web 2 becomes, we'll say, passe and people don't want to engage that way? Is, is there any discussion in this futuristic way of how Web 3 will impact data analytics for your, for your space, I guess? Well, I mean, so for me, and in context for everyone here, I work around data all the time. So uh, for me, the data is fan data, right? That's our markets, right? And I can cohort that fan data in a variety of different ways. They're app users. They use both things. Um, you know, <laughs> it's, it's tricky because I mostly am just, again, on platform. So you know, for me, I'm, I'm about building the best experience first, and then how do our fans engage with it? So I think for us, it's, it's going to be, we have to, first of all, own what our customers are doing and whether or not other people can see it either, we have to be the best at understanding what this data actually means. It helps us get further out in front of anything that we want to build, you know, we're trying to be in some instances, my point of view only, sorry, but my point of view is I want to replace the TV where I can. I mean, for me, we are on the go and most people today, and I think user analytics and data suggests that people are more on the go than they ever have been before. Um, I, yeah, I don't, <laughs> it's hard. I've got a lot of data. I wish I could like access everything that I, I had more easily sometimes because it's super, super complex. How long do you think it would take Right. Like in order to make even if even if everything became accessible and, and aggregated together, like how long would it even take for people to even see anything from it? Like, I don't know. Um, for me, it's fan first always. I just have to focus on what are they coming in for? What are our business drivers? What do we need to drive subscriptions for? Sometimes what other folks are doing is kind of irrelevant to decisions that we're going to make. We're a rights holder, right? I mean, we're sort of a very, very unique entity where I don't know of one company that I would say is a, a, a complete one-to-one -one competitor to us. I see Google as a competitor to us. Um, you know, it's, it's a long-winded like way of trying to get to your question, but I don't know. I feel like we've got a pretty good handle on what we're trying to do. Um, I just think sort of the future of some of these other new digital experiences and what that will do to eat into, right? The time that I've already secured or the time I'm already handshaking with our fans. Um, I worry a lot about competition honestly and the emergence of, of different technologies and I sort of see it this isn't anything scientific when I say this number, but I just like to say it like, we got 30 seconds to capture their attention if they come to us. If you don't get them in 30 seconds, then, you know, they're, they're gonna be off and on their way, or they're gonna go answer the question that they came in to get in the first place, and then there they go. Like, can we get people deeper? But like, there's a lot of ownership of data questions and challenges out there. I mean, it definitely comes up right? League partners have different access to what fans are consuming than what we have. Um, I think, you know, companies will need to be smart at how you can 
share information in order to improve the overall experience and product, right? But I think it could also make for some complicated business relationships because some people have incredibly strong opinions, right, about what we should be doing and or building. And from my perspective, I serve fans. I don't serve league. I don't serve leagues. I don't serve league partnerships. While there may be elements of that, right, in my work, I'm I want to be fan fan first. And the more everybody can see the data, the more every the more it can be weaponized. The more it can be. I think even cause rifts if you don't have the right sort of collection of leaders sort of coming to the table to talk about, you know, what it is that we're seeing or how we can work together in order to do something new or different. I'm happy. I mean, that, that was a very tough, loaded question. And I'm it happy was. that you, you, you shared. These are the questions that we're facing it's all in good. society. Um, what happens if we own our data instead of companies and, and how do these companies who thrive on, on user data survive in the future? I mean, uh, it's data is power, it's knowledge and it's information. And I think when used appropriately, um, it can be great. You know, everything you do, just start from a question. And that's the thing I try to tell people all the time. If you're going to start playing with data, what problem are you trying to solve? What are you looking to accomplish? Um, so that then you have you set up the right path of what data you want to look at, right? Let let's also unpack this. You have a business degree, correct? Yeah. And we will it's assume a, it's not it's not a computer science or no. or so. There's a lot of of what I would argue. Um, myths happening that in order to be good at data, you can only be uh, business analytics or computer science. But it sounds like, you know, you can be also really good with data, even if you have a, a different type of business degree. Is there any advice you would have? Because if data is power, but I don't want to major in computer science or business analytics, how do I become a leg up? and become a master of my universe by leveraging not just data, but to be good with data. How, what advice would you have for someone in those situations? Because there's many of them. Yeah, I mean, I still go back to curiosity. You've got to ask questions. And sometimes I'm not afraid to ask what might be perceived as a silly question or how do you not know that? If I don't get it, I'm going to ask because I got to make sure I get it. And then once I get it, then it leads me to other questions. I don't pull numbers. I don't manipulate spreadsheets. I ask questions. And then I ask people to go bring me the data that answers my questions. Um, so it's really, it's, it's really more about strategic thinking. And in order to do that, I mean, I really think you've got to at least have foundational knowledge. What do these KPIs mean? What do these data points mean? How are they measured? But you don't have to be crunching numbers in order to sort of understand that. So the art is really in what kinds of questions are we asking and or what are our business priorities and our business goals? Because then again, that should then lead to, okay, if, you know, if it's selling subscriptions, it's not just selling subscriptions, right? You want to retain Right. So you're looking at retention, you're looking at driving subscription. So that then now takes you into a whole different few ways that you may want to look at um, how you're, in my case, curating all of these digital experiences such that we're helping to drive our direct to consumer business forward, but then finding the right mechanisms to keep people understanding the value of this subscription now to, to kind of keep them on longer, right? You don't want your customers to just be one and done. I'm looking for loyalty. I'm trying to create loyalty. I'm trying to drive loyalty. Any business should be wanting to do that, honestly. So I, I do encourage folks to think of like, what, what is the right sort of loyalty metric for my particular business? And let that be the heart and soul of what you push forward because you want repeat behavior, right? You want repeat usage. It kind of doesn't matter what you do. 
And in a world today where there's so many options and so many different distractions, it's so much harder, I think, to get repeat usage and repeat behavior and technology. It's changing everything. So however you worked before, forget about it. Like, don't fall in love with how you do your job. Like I tell people that all the time because something's going to change it, whether it's a leader, whether it's technology, um, what have you. I love that you shared it's about asking questions. And that's something that I try to spur in my classes, particularly the challenges, the projects that they're working on. They have to uh, get curious about the one of the classes, curious about the, the, the local problems in, in Tampa Bay community. They have to do research, ask constant questions, collect data, primary, secondary, white papers, other research, and then formulate a final question that they're going to try and solve and then use innovation and prototyping. And so, that, so this sounds very much related to what you're, you're suggesting is, is also very important as part of the process. 100%, and if there was anything I would tell folks to get a little practice on, it's the art of an executive summary. <laughs> I feel like the further you go along in your career, putting together very succinct words, putting to forward your statement, like in journalism, they say, don't bury the lead. I would say the same thing, don't bury the lead. I've definitely learned that oh, I'm a little wordy when I like to explain things. And even it comes through on paper sometimes. And I've really had to work hard to sort of get to succinct words, work on communication. Communication is so important. Finding common language. And sometimes I'm challenged to describe my job because I fall right into like our work jargon when there's probably more, you know, layman's terminology that I can use to get, you know, again, other people to sort of understand what I'm going after. But I've definitely used many different forms of whether it's an executive summary, that one sheeter, learn how to write the one sheeter, you know, and you want to make sure that folks understand the change that they would see through adopting what it is that you're proposing like that. It's got to hit home. It's got to strike a chord with your audience. Like, and if we do these things, right, this is the change that we would, that, that we would see and, and really punctuate a point and, Data often can help you make your arguments there, right? We we use something similar. Um, I would call it a brief, but we call it a, the tool would be a, a value proposition. Of yep. course, there's a situation, context, you know, what, what the solution is through the value prop, supporting data and evidence, and maybe an example or mock-up or something like this. So these are relevant. It's a way to yes. brainstorm. And, and so I'm happy that, you're sharing that this is important. This is relevant. And this is some standard, some practice, common practices, actually. 100%. And it, it does not just apply to trying to drive a new project forward or get a project greenlit. This is literally if you're a leader of a team and you need to reorganize your group and you need to make the case to HR and your leaders that this is what you need to do. If you're trying to put people up for promotion, guess what? This is what you have to do. So if if you aspire to really be a people, people leader, um, I, I've written more <laughs> justifications that have touched every aspect of, of my work. Again, whether it's like day to day versus we need to change something to maybe even me pitching some sort of larger organizational change to executives because maybe I see something they're not seeing right now and you want to put it out there, you know? So it, it, it's a skill that will get repurposed in many, many, many different ways, honestly. Dana, please chime in if you have any questions. Uh, I would like to ask this one before we, we open it up. Leadership, the world has changed. Sports media has changed, journalism has changed. In your 15 plus years, how has leadership changed and where is it going? Or what advice would you have for, for those who are expected to lead in the future? Yeah, so for me, I would just say, I think I've tried to pride myself on being very well-rounded, right? I feel that there are um, many leaders in positions, and I'm not speaking, you know, about like just ESPN, but in general, in, in, in all of my careers, I think there's been leaders in positions that have gotten there through attrition, right? I, I just view leadership, the people component of it. 
Like we leaders are, are what create the actual culture. Uh, I think culture is super important. I think culture has never been more important than it is right now. If you're seeing how, how quickly folks are moving um, around, changing jobs. Um, so to me, a little bit of, there's so many movements I say happening right now in, the, in, in, in society that it's finally right-sized. I think the percentages of where people need to be strong as leaders. So what I'm saying is that being a great people leader should have been there all along. I don't think it was, um, I don't think it was praised and valued and measured as much as I think it will be going forward. And I think that's a tremendous step forward, no matter who you are, uh, whether you are an employee, I think it makes leaders jobs harder, particularly if you don't feel like that's <laughs> being a great people leader, you can drive all the results you want, but if you are not making a connection with, with your people, they will leave you. They will leave, especially your talent. Um, so for me, you got to be good with the people that you're leading. I mean, hands down, hands down. And that may mean you've got to wear six different hats because you've got six very different personalities reporting into you, which I do right now. And the way I interact with them individually is, is slightly different because I want to get the most out of those, those folks. Pe you know, to me, it's less time doing work. I'm trying to really focus on giving all of our individual people all the time that they need to be successful because they're incredibly smart. Um, I'm here to remove obstacles. Um, that's why we hired them because they're incredibly smart and capable of doing these roles. So, you know, I'm trying to clear hurdles. And again, I, I will go back because I'm, I won't say anything that I'm afraid to come back to me, but finally, I feel like leadership is, is being seen through a broader, a broader lens. And this broader lens is the right lens. Thank you. It's one of the biggest challenges that we're facing in terms of developing future leaders. And you gotta be a great listener. I mean, honestly, if there's any, if there's any skill to focus on and it's a challenge, I mean, I feel like I just interrupted you, um, like listening and, and like really listening to understand because I have a mind that goes constantly and, you know, my, my directs will tease me and they'll say that from that up movie, like squirrel, because we'll be talking about something. And next thing you know, my mind has moved on and they're still circling around something and they've got to sort of bring me back. And it's something that, you know, it's great that they tell me that it's great that they call me on that because I literally want to put everything down and listen intently. And it's really super important because you're missing a lot of cues. You're missing a lot of things in nuanced conversation when you're not fully engaged. So that I think, and that's just, again, networking, curiosity, the more you listen, you are going to absorb things that will pay off. You will. Great. I have a game if, if you're up for playing a game. <laughs> Is it a game I can win? I'm pretty competitive. <laughs> I, it's more, it's, well, I, I don't I'm know. Teasing. <laughs> I'm teasing. So, so you just came from uh, MIT Sports Analytics. They're talking about a lot of technology. I'm wondering just a, a simple uh, thumbs up, thumbs down, or yes, it'll revolutionize or no, it won't revolutionize, particularly your area of sports media. Okay. So if I say VR and VR headsets, is that going to revolutionize your industry for the better? We'll say whatever, whatever that means to you. And you don't need to justify what that means. Is VR so headsets okay. going to ruin? I think VR will have a space in enhancing the viewer experience, particularly those that cannot get to the stadiums. Will it be a headset or will they need to create a piece of technology that's less cumbersome? That I absolutely believe. Uh, crypto, does it play a role in sports media or what you guys are doing in the future? And does it, does it revolutionize the industry? I'm not in those conversations. <laughs> uh, what about... Um, We'll say the metaverse in general, whatever we know, whatever that is. I don't even know if right? that's a definition for whatever that is. 
Does, does it revolutionize? And I would assume it's different than just the VR headset or VR. So does it revolutionize sooner or later or yes or no? I think we're going to see things iterative, you know, in an iterative way sort of come out and experiment. I actually just think we're in the world of experimentation right now more than ever. You know, NFTs are another one. I mean, there's a lot of things sort of popping up these days. And I think they all have some form of legitimacy to them. Um, maybe also because being a sports fan is a lot more complicated today than it was years ago, right? There's sports fans who just really love to follow what athletes are putting on social. They don't want to read about news. And so it's it's just, it's fascinating because I think it's all opportunity, but at some point, what's what's really going to hit a home run in the mainstream and be at scale and not just be, you know, sort of serving more of a niche subset of a, of a broader audience. I think gaming is super in interesting just by way of how our younger generation is growing up. Minecraft, right? They create these worlds. It's just, it's fascinating. So I do feel like there's going to be some, there's going to be something there. Um, you know, long term, but for me personally, it's personalization. Straight up. What does that mean exactly? That's what I have to figure out. We have to keep iterating. I mean, we have a personalized uh, mobile app right now. If you're registered and you pick your favorites, I think it's going to be, you know, in my world, right? It can be a combination of things. You can explicitly tell us things that you want. You know, are there ways that we can follow you through our ecosystem and then based off what you consume we can then infer some other things to surface up to you right so some explicit some implicit you know i think the trick with being an owned digital property like my like what what my team does is we also have to follow what fan behavior is saying we also have to drive business priorities and yeah you know you'll if you notice that people have ads in front of their videos, they make money there, right? And it's this really fascinating, interesting twist of sort of, I want to give you what we think you want. I want to make sure you see these things that we have, right? And then, you know, there's also just this element being a sports media uh, entity that, you know, through the lens of journalism, sometimes there are just things that we're going to do because it is the right thing to do. And all of those other elements get thrown out the window and it does not matter. So it personalization, that's why it's so important because again, there's so many different things that we can do. I really want to tap into the fan because some of these other experiences are just as much going to be the visions of the people creating them. And I just want to make sure that whatever it is that we are doing is meeting the expectation of what a fan thinks is a, is a personalized experience. So it's tricky. It's really tricky. In the innovation world, we frame these two concepts as push and pull mm -hmm. uh, to create new products to the market. And there's no agreed upon best model or when or where or what to a certain extent. But I like that you shared that because that's exactly what we're learning in the classroom. And there's pros and cons to each method and how to go about doing that. Dana, any any last questions? I I can go on and on about technology, and and maybe we could si sidebar some of those. But I definitely want to open the floor for for other questions that might be there. Yes. So first, Nicole, thank you so much for for <laughs> coming on and spending your time with us today. I know you are a busy woman and a difficult woman to get a hold of. So I appreciate you <laughs> coming on and giving us your knowledge so much. Um, so I actually have a couple questions. So my first question is, um, earlier you said that they put you into like this web design position and, um, where you started like, you know, working on the web design for ESPN was that, um, and it seemed like it was kind of like out of nowhere where you, did you yeah. not have experience in it? And why did they put you in this position? Like, what did they see in you that they thought like you would be a good fit for that position at that time? Yes. So I think in order to answer that question, I'll start by saying my career at ESPN is broken up into two halves. The first half I spent with a group called the Stats and Information Group. This is why I go to Sports Analytics Conference. And we're all about scores, data, box scores. What can we do with it? Storytelling. Um, but at the midpoint of my career, uh, I was encouraged by my boss who was uh, retiring. Mm -hmm. And um, he definitely said, hey, put your name in the hat for my job. 
right? You never know. This is a great experience for you. Um, I was interviewing um, alongside two colleagues of mine on the same team, one of which was already a vice president at that given time. Um, so it just didn't feel like it was going to work out. But to me, it was, this is great exposure for you to these other executives who are going to be interviewing for this position. So went through that interview process, did not get the job. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did not get the job. Um, I was a little disappointed, but Hey, whatever went back. And I said, what do you need to see from me? This is going to be relevant. I promise. What do you need to see from me? And, um, the, the feedback I received at that time was, we want to see you lead a big team. So I still go back to influence over authority because the, the role I had at the time, I had to be more influential against uh, with people that had no reporting structure into me to get things done. That is way harder than telling people to report into you to just go do something. But that wasn't valued in the way that I thought it would have been during this interview process. We want to see you lead a big team. Okay. So I went to the individual who got the job and I said, they want to see me lead a big team. Is there anything we can do here so I can start to work towards this perceived gap in, in my, you know, my capabilities, whatever it is, so I can continue to advance. And at the time, um, this individual said that uh, as much as he would love to help me, like he had some other things that he wanted to give some other opportunities to. And I got it because I enjoyed all of my colleagues. I, this wasn't about competition. It was just a question. Can you do this for me? And it wasn't going to work out. Um, so when I didn't get the job, one of the executives I interviewed with, and I, I know this was a part of my spiel, um, that I like to see myself as a change agent. Um, I really do. And not saying change for the sake of change, but I'm the kind of person who wants to be able to rally people around change if that's what we need to do. And I will help influence and I will help get everybody over the, over the finish line. Um, and help start something new. Again, very entrepreneurial. Like we can blow everything up and do it differently if we really want to. And if we think we have a better way of going about it. So really what happened is, is I didn't get the job. This individual reached out to me and said, hey, we have this position over here. It was a lateral. There would have been no promotion for me or anything like that. And I said, well, this sounds great. I want to be in the digital space. However, I'm chasing this specific feedback. They want me to lead a bigger team. Will this lead to a bigger team? And without any specifics, um, this individual said, yeah, I think we can take care of that for you. So I actually took a lateral job halfway through my career for one direct report and a handshake that whatever it is that would come would lead to a bigger, an opportunity for me to get the experience that I was seeking. So I did it. I think that's actually really amazing because I have noticed that in today's society, that's what they're doing a lot. So a lot of people are hiring, not necessarily because you have the best resume for this position, but they feel like you're the best person to fit with the team and the company and your values align with, with the goals and the values of that company. And they can see you growing with that company because of course, you know, this person's resume might be like, Oh, I have a master's in such and such. And I have all this experience and stuff. And this person, it might be similar, but not as qualified, but they feel like that person will be a better match, you know, once they interview them. So I've seen that a lot. Um, well on LinkedIn from, uh, people who hire other people and stuff like that and how they interact. And I think that's a beautiful thing because, you know, it might not, it's, it's giving other people an opportunity and, you know, the fact that you were given an opportunity in a completely different field and then you excelled in it, you know, they could have hired somebody who was specific in that field, but they would have only seen the, pers the perspective of that person who knows everything. You came from a completely different viewpoint and that I think added value for the situation that you were put into. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm pretty direct. You're right. And, and I'll go back to, and I got to work on my communication, trust me, but People really should be thoughtful in their communication. If there's anything I would go back and tell myself, like, how can I be more thoughtful, intentional in my communication if I were to redo some things? Mm -hmm. Not that I have any regrets. It's not that. It's just, again, about relationships and, and communication is how you sort of um, work with people. Look, I, I don't know if I got lucky. I don't know if I said the right things in that interview. Um, but I was, I was straight and I, and I tried to tell folks who, cause I have people who come to me all the time and say, Oh, you made that move right from one department to another. And that doesn't always happen for a ton of people. 
mm -hmm. especially at a big company, because you only see your career this way. And I was like, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I was chasing something specific. They weren't going to give it to me here. Digital, what we were doing with stats and box scores, that feeds a lot of what digital does. So I already had a foundation. I didn't need to be an expert. I had a foundation of things. And you know, if, and I don't know if this is just, I know I hear this a lot as it relates to women very specifically, that they won't apply for a job if they don't have all of the qualifications that they see in the job description. I don't care who you are or how you identify. That's hogwash. It's hogwash. It really is. You don't. I identify with that very much. Put yourself out there, but be smart study those job descriptions and be intentional and smart and how you relate to what you've done to what it is that they're looking for. Cause it's skills, mm -hmm. it's skills. And again, like I can talk to somebody about how being an all-star cheerleading coach for four teams. Actually, I learned more teaching five to eight year old little girls, 18 of them, a two minute routine than I've done in a lot of things in my day. Talk about patience. Right. Or learning how to communicate. Right. But I can you can pay that off in a way that can relate specifically to the thing that you're going for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then I have one more quick question because I know you have to go. Um, what does a day look like for you? I know a day you have many different days and you guys do a lot of different things. But from somebody like me who don't who doesn't really understand what it is you do, I understand, I guess, the end goal I can see. But What's your position in, in all of this? Like, I'm sure you do a lot of delegating and you do a lot of like, you know what you're talking about. So you tell people what to do. But like, I guess what are some important things that, that you can tell me so I can get a better understanding of what it is that you really do? Yeah, I, I manage my people to manage up, honestly. So you just said, <laughs> um, you know, tell people what to do. I actually try to more so ask people what they think we should do. Mm. So okay. again, like I don't sit here and feel like I have all the right answers, but mm -hmm. if I'm curious and I can ask smart, open-ended questions, you'd be amazed at what you can get people to reveal uh, to you. My day, you know, I, every week I have I have six direct reports and I alternate three each week, right? I probably have, <laughs> I don't know, at least eight to 10 hours of impromptu. Hey, you got a few minutes. Let's catch up on some things. So I actually probably give at least 20, 25 to 33 percent, a quarter to a third of my time directly to my direct reports, period. They get the biggest chunk of my time mm -hmm. because they are leading verticals on my team, whether it's people or strategy. Um, I don't do, I don't want to say I don't do a lot because I don't, I don't mean it that way. I participate now in a lot of different types of meetings. I have regular meetings, whether it's, you know, things around ad sales or the revenue side of our business. I am a part of a, um, an innovation committee that stretches all of, uh, ESPN, you know, it, I have a lot of things that are in regular nature like that but I literally spend most of my time with my people and I'm also a DEI champion, honestly, um, for an executive at the company. So I actually lead a, a council right now that's very much focused on um, unearthing places where we could be a more inclusive work environment and what are things that we can change in how we work. So that's been taking up a good chunk of my time, time well worth it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, it's not, it's not crazy. I know when to pop in. I stayed up and watched the, the UFC pay-per-view on Saturday. Cause I had a bunch of my people on vacation and I will take one for the team and stay up <laughs> till 1am, <laughs> you know, but it sounds like you work smarter, not harder from everything. That you will learn that I was a, listen, I did my 80, 90 hours a week mm -hmm. salaried. But when I was doing that, I was learning. Mm -hmm. I was getting something out of it. It was, I did not feel for one second that ESPN was getting more out of that time than I was. In fact, I value my time so much <laughs> that I'm pretty adamant that I get the absolute most I can out of whatever time 
I put into something, but I was in such learning mode and I was so fascinated about this place I was at mm -hmm. and had no idea where I was even going to fit. So, and then when you move again from Tampa all the way up here, you know, I had to go all in and give it a, a good, honest try because, you know, I left everything I loved for an opportunity and I have skin in the game, right? On what that opportunity is. I don't, I don't wait for people to tell me. Sometimes you get, you can shape it yourself. Mm -hmm. I like that. Thank you. N You're welcome. Nicole, thank you for your time. Of course. We are, we are curious to know what's next for you and the mm. new product services and everything that are coming. If this, if the audience wanted to stay connected or if you had any last words, this is your opportunity. And maybe uh, if you, if you thought that students wanted to reach out and build that network and, and practice their curiosity and, and listening yes. skills or or to engage with you, is there a way that they can stay in contact? Absolutely. I mean, please share. I mean, I'm found on LinkedIn. Look me up. I'm 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 on there quite a bit. Um, I'm happy to engage with folks. I have a a broad team too that loves talking to folks. So it's not even like I'm not a one person band here. We work really hard to constantly talk to people about coming into the company. I don't recruit personally just for the perspective of my department. I recruit for the enterprise itself. But beyond that, I love talking about this stuff. I really do. And I'm happy to offer some, some perspective and, and something a little bit more specific, you know, when it comes to examples, right? We can talk in general terms all we want. But if, if I were to leave, like, definitely I'm going to go back to curiosity is table stakes. I'm saying table stakes because if you are not curious right now, somebody else is, somebody else is going to get an opportunity that maybe could have been yours. Um, and there's a variety of different ways to tackle that, but it's table stakes for career opportunities, right? Um, or career mobility. If you want to be able to like, you're already doing something, but you want to move, move around. And I, I go back to, and I'll say it again, because I've never felt that this is more true. Now I lead a big team. I got just about 90 people reporting into me now. So I got a big team. I can sit here and tell you the most challenging work I did was not leading a big team. It was being a small, a part of a four or five person team where I was taking things that we needed to do or that we wanted to accomplish or that we wanted to build. And I had to go get buy-in from others. To, to be a part of that. So it's the influence, right? I go back to influence. Leading a big team is not that challenging. All I'll say is, you know, look, and this is a crazy world we live in today. And so, you know, um, being attentive to individual needs is super important. And that is a challenge of leading a big team, no doubt about it. But influencing somebody else to, to get on board. And then if you are pushing to influence somebody else, you have to also be open to being influenced yourself. Because there have been times I had to come to a table, really push our agenda, what we wanted to do. But then when I could sort of hear the other ideas or the places where these resources could go, I had to absolutely be the kind of leader that can say, I understand why we need to do that first. This can wait. So I think that's that's important, right? When you're trying to influence, you also have to be open to being influenced in return. All that's curiosity anyways. You, you know what I'm saying? So I, I, I would say, I, I would think those are the, those are really the things that have rung true no matter what position I've been in. And honestly, you know, you'll find that some of this stuff plays out in your personal lives as well, you know, and being like coming at problems from a different way or being a really, really in, in, intentional listener. Um, you're missing stuff if you're not really listening intently. Thank you for your time, oh, wow. Nicole. This has been excellent putting theory and practice together from you your career journey, your profession, endless thanks, and we will be in touch. Okay. We have more to discuss and we'll talk uh, soon. Thank you very oh. much.
I love coming to Tampa, so I'd stop <laughs> by on one of my next trips. We're, we're going to take you up on that for sure. <laughs> Thank you, you folks. Have a good one. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.